It's been six months since some of the biggest names in artificial intelligence called for a temporary pause on the development of certain types of AI. We need a wake-up call here. We have a perfect storm of corporate irresponsibility, widespread adoption of these new tools, a lack of regulation, and a huge number of unknowns. AI luminary Gary Marcus was one of the people who signed the letter, along with more than a thousand other notable names in the field. This episode, we speak with Gary Marcus about what's changed since the letter published, what hasn't, and how he's thinking about the way forward. I'm Jennifer Strong, and this is Shift. Now here on the steering column is a device called AutoCruise. You simply set the speed you want. Self-driving robo-taxis are already on the road in two years. How the disc rotates, a mirror reflects the light in the way that depends on how the signal was recorded. This is the 100 terabyte action. I present to you Electro, the Mono Man. Ladies and gentlemen. I would say that one of my greatest skills is my ability to interact with you. Support for this podcast comes from Pandata, the data science consulting practice for high-risk industries including healthcare, defense, and financial services. Hi, I'm Gary Marcus. I'm a scientist and an entrepreneur. I've been thinking about natural intelligence and artificial intelligence for pretty much all my life. So it's been about six months or so since you signed what a lot of us referred to as the pause letter. For those who don't know or maybe forgot some of the details, can you remind us what's in it? Sure. I didn't write the letter, but I signed it and I helped popularize it. So some people think I did write it. And there's always been a little bit of a mystery about who exactly wrote it. The so-called pause letter, what it said is, hey, we're moving really fast here and we don't quite know what we're doing. And maybe we should slow down. And it suggested pausing one thing and only one thing, which was the development of GPT-5 and similar system said, we don't really understand even how to keep systems like GPT-4 safe. Why should we rush to make GPT-5? We did not call for the pausing of all AI research. And in fact, we encouraged having more research on safety, security, on building AI that's trustworthy. A lot of people misinterpreted it as a ban on AI altogether, which it was not, um, or a ban on all AI research, which it was not. It was a ban on one specific project on making a bigger version of a system that we already know is unreliable and we already know we don't know how to make reliable. Now, that, of course, didn't happen. I don't think any of us expected that it would. There's too much money at stake. There are issues of national pride and all these kinds of things standing in the way. But I think we did succeed in getting people to realize that the issues are serious, that there are a lot of risks around these systems and that we don't really know what we're doing at this stage. And so on the whole, I'm glad that I signed the letter, even though I got some pushback and so forth, because it was really good to get this stuff on the world agenda. And we succeeded at that. You were in good company. A number of well-known people signed that letter. Steve Wozniak, Tristan Harris, Elon Musk. Well, Yasha Bengio signed it too. I mean, um, he's one of the founders of Deep Learning, often called one of the godfathers of AI. Um, There were a lot of eminent people that signed. And, you know, in the end, I think 33,000 people signed it. So I was hardly alone. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Though when you say it didn't really change things, in some ways, things have changed. I mean... Where's GPT-5, right? Well, that's actually an interesting story in itself. So as you may know, I gave testimony to the U.S. Senate, uh, the Judiciary Subcommittee on AI Oversight in May, and I sat next to Sam Altman. And he was asked about GPT-5, and it sounded like, from what he said, they're not actually building GPT-5. 
Not probably because we asked him not to. I think he scoffed at our letter. But my theory is they actually tried to make it work and it didn't. It would be very expensive to train it. He's out raising more money for the company. It might cost, I don't know, $100 million or a billion dollars. I suspect that they tried to train it, realized that it was having a lot of the same problems and said, wait a minute, we shouldn't actually train it. So there's a certain irony around that. that the thing that we called for to be suspended actually probably was suspended, but probably for financial reasons. So I'm doing a little bit of between the lines reading of what he said. He was not fully explicit about what was going on. And how are you feeling about these hearings just in general? Well, first of all, there are some hearings that are public and some that are private. I'm more worried about the private ones than the public ones. I thought that the one that I was in with, with Sam was terrific. I thought that the Senate rightly acknowledged that they were too slow to regulate social media, that that was consequential, and they didn't want to get this one wrong. And I think that represents a real sentiment across Washington. And I've been talking to lots of people in governments internationally. I think everybody feels that way. And that's good. It's motivation to get something done. At the same time, I look what's happening in Washington, and there are many different senators with different proposals and in different stages of development that are not necessarily well coordinated. I actually like the Holly and Blumenthal bill, um, which was based on the um, proceedings that I, I was part of. And I, I think they are proposing a lot of things that are, are pretty sensible. Schumer has his own play right now where he had a private meeting. It's hard to know what that is and how it relates to the other. I think that there's some hope that we might do the right thing here, but it, there's also some chance that it, it will die in politics. And if you'd like, I could tell you some of the things I think we should do. Yeah, absolutely, I do. So I think, number one, every country, including the United States, needs to have its own national AI agency. Some of what we need is covered by existing laws, but lots of things that we need are not covered by existing laws. There's no law, for example, that says that an artist or writer needs to consent to have their work used by an AI system. And maybe we want that. You know, It's not something our founders envisioned when they wrote the Constitution, but circumstances change. And I think it, it might fit the views of many people in society to say, hey, you can't just train the stuff that I do on your model and not compensate me. So we might need new laws there. And that's just one example. Another example is we don't really have the right ways of dealing with discrimination in so-called black box systems like generative AI, where we don't understand what they're doing and they could discriminate against people in job decisions, loan decisions, and so forth. So we need a national AI agency looking out for that and also for opportunities. I just you know mentioned some risks, but there are also opportunities. We want to figure out how we can save as much money in the government by using these technologies while understanding their limitations. So national AI agency. I think we need a global AI agency or some kind of global AI system where nations can coordinate on both the risks and opportunities of AI. There may be long-term risks, at least conceivable, that AI could try to take over the world or bad actors could try to use it to do that. We don't really have solutions for that right now. We don't have information sharing around that. So we really need coordination around that. We also need coordination on standards. It's very expensive to train these models. And if every company has to train 193 models for 100 93 countries. It's disaster for the environment. So there's good reason from the environmental perspective and from the company perspective to have global coordination around AI. So that would be the second thing I would point to. The third thing I would point to is an FDA-like approval system where if you want to put something, deploy it to hundreds of millions of people, you have to go through some process where you show that the benefits exceed the risks. So right now, there are a lot of risks for generative AI ranging from misinformation and disinformation to cybercrime and so forth. The risks are at least partly known. Are they offset by the benefits? Well, the benefits so far are things like programmers can code more quickly. Well, we wouldn't want programmers to code more quickly at the price of democracy. And there's a risk that misinformation will actually overrun democracy. Companies should have to make the argument that what they're doing is in the public interest. In the same way that if you put a new medicine, you have to show that the benefits outweigh the risks. There's no legal requirement of that right now. Another thing I would insist on is data transparency. We need to know what these systems are trained on. We need to know that in terms of compensating artists, in terms of avoiding bias, and in terms of allowing outsiders to try to mitigate the risks. So I could go on all day, but I give you those uh, four to get started. Are there places in the world you think are doing a better job on this that we should be paying more attention to? 
the EU is definitely doing a better job. They're not there yet, that they have an AI Act, they have their Digital Services Act. The AI Act is not law yet. They're still negotiating some pieces of it, and so none of it's operative until they all agree. But I think it's thought through in more detail than any specific piece of legislation that's similarly far along. I really do like the Blumenthal and Hawley bill, um, but it's very early days for that. I mean, they just proposed it, but we're a long way from, from seeing it become law. Okay, when I last saw you, I think it was I think it was spring at the TED conference. You mentioned you were still thinking the world needs an agency like CERN, which is what we have for nuclear research that advances the science but within some guardrails. I've also heard people suggest we need something similar to what we use to regulate medical devices um, among other ideas. And I'm wondering, have your thoughts changed at all? So these things are not mutually exclusive, and and one has to find the right model. But the emphasis on the CERN for AI idea is to have international collaboration on AI and trying to build better AI. The AI that we have right now is just fundamentally not trustworthy. Like if you ask it to write a biography of you, it's going to make something up. Somebody had a biography of me the other day. They used one of these systems, and they said, make sure that it mentions his pet chicken or something like that. I don't have a pet chicken. And it it went on to say, it it wrote a nice biography about how it was, I don't know, inspiring leader in the field or whatever. It was all, all, you know, I appreciate it. And then there was this line that said that, that I drew inspiration from my pet chicken, Henrietta. Well, I don't have a pet chicken named Henrietta. And it, it, you know, it looks just as authoritative as the rest of it. The rest of it's actually true. So it finally mixes together BS with truth. And like, we don't want AI like that. We might actually need international collaboration to work on that and also to work on mitigating some of the problems, like the deliberate use of misinformation. We don't have a technology right now that can automate fact-checking, and we sorely need such a thing, given the volume of misinformation that these systems are going to create. So I do still think we need something like that. And I'm actually starting a nonprofit called the Center for Advancement of Trustworthy AI, CATI.org, C-A-T-A-I.org. And one part of what we're trying to do is to see if we can get a kind of philanthropic bootstrapping for such a thing. So I would love to see government sponsor it. I'm also working as a private citizen to see if, if we might do a nonprofit with philanthropic funding that pushes in that direction. I think it's absolutely needed, which is not to say that we don't need international treaties and enforcement and so forth. Those are going to take a longer time, and I'm trying to figure out what we might do in a shorter term with philanthropic help. And CERN for AI, which I actually originally proposed in 2017 um, in the New York Times, is, is something that we definitely still should be looking at. We'll be back right after this. Hackers and cyber criminals have always held this kind of special fascination. Obviously, I can't tell you too much about what I do. It's a game. Who's the best hacker? And I was like, well, this is child's play. I'm Dina Temple Raston, and on the Click Here podcast, you'll meet them and the people trying to stop them. We're not afraid of the attack. We're afraid of the creativity and the intelligence of the human being behind it. Click Here, stories about the people making and breaking our digital world. AI machines, satellite, engine ignition, click here, and lift off. Every Tuesday, wherever you get your podcasts. So going back to this letter, a while back, you said you had a sense of mild regret about signing it. It doesn't sound like that's true now, but I'm curious to hear you talk us through that. I regret the amount of time I had to put in to clarifying misinterpretations. It was very political where people deliberately misinterpreted it. For example, taking it to be a ban on AI, which it wasn't. And I had to spend a lot of time explaining what it actually said, which is frustrating because anybody who wanted to read it could read it. It was right there on the web. So I had some regret about the amount of time I had to put into explaining it. I do think that the call to get people to wake up was important. And, you know, it's impossible to say whether the world would have been better off or not if it actually had the moratorium. But I do think um, that the, the world certainly is better off because a lot more people are paying attention to the risks. Something else that's top of mind, in some ways things haven't really changed in the last six months or so, but in other ways, things really have. I mean, especially in the way people who are not part of the AI community, they're now really thinking about some of these issues. 
And that's great, right? It's really good that a lot of people outside the AI community are thinking about this, right? You have a lot of researchers that are technically gifted in, in certain areas of mathematics and certain procedures about cleaning data and stuff like that. And that's great. But we need people who think about ethics and just people from civil society more generally to think about this because we're making policies right now, we're trying to make policies that are going to affect like the next century of humanity. And so it shouldn't just be people in the AI community thinking about this. You know, I remember when I started covering AI in 2017, it was not a beat there was a lot of competition for. It just it just didn't seem like something lots of people would be interested in. And now you look around, especially in the last several months, and it feels like pretty much everyone has at least some understanding of what this is and why it all matters. ChatGPT for better and worse, change the world. I think of it like a dress rehearsal. I don't think it's actually very good. It's not the AI that we ultimately want because it has all these problems with trustworthiness and hallucination. But it got everybody in the world to think about, well, if we had AI, what would it be good for? What would the problems with it be? And that's just so important. You know, Ernie Davis and I wrote a book called Rebooting AI in 2019, and we laid out a lot of these issues. We talked about trustworthiness that was in the subtitle of the book, but nobody really cared then. And I think it's great that everybody is paying attention now, and hopefully we can work all this through together. And, you know, part, part of your question is, am I manic depressive about all of this? Yes. I mean, like, there are days when I'm like, everybody's paying attention now. They're thinking hard about it. This is great. And then on a day, it's like the politics here are just so hard. Are we going to get anything done? Are the big companies just going to capture the governments and not really, you know, lead to anything good? I don't know what the outcome is going to be. I do know that now is the moment to try to get it right. You know, Gary, you're one of the keenest observers of this field. So now that everybody's watching, what should they be paying attention to? I think the number one thing that people should be watching on the policy side is, are governments going to get independent scientists involved, or are they just going to cut backroom deals with the people who run the big companies? And I'm afraid it's going to be the latter. And that's something really to watch out on. And you see all these photo opportunities where there are private meetings, big government leaders meeting big tech leaders. And that's just not good because, you know, we know how that story ends. So that's one. On the technical side, this hallucination problem is really central. I brought it up in 2001, you know, over 20 years ago in, in my book, The Algebraic Mind, and there's still no real solution to it. People keep having kind of wishful thinking that if we just have more data, we'll solve it. But as we saw with driverless cars, having more data does not necessarily solve complicated problems where you have unusual cases, what we call outliers, every now and then. So you know, Tesla drives into a jet airplane, for example, because it's not in its training set. So we have the same kind of issue here. The key technical issue is, can anybody solve that? Can they get these systems to be trustworthy and reliable? And I'm sure some AI technology can do that, but I'm not sure that anything that will be invented right now will solve that, because I think people are focusing too hard on a single technology that's very accessible, but at the same time flawed. And so the technical question is, can people make these things actually work in a reliable way so you can trust them? You know, I feel like there's some whiplash. We went from fears of killer robots or at least the AI community telling people not to be worried about that exactly to parts of the AI community now warning people that AI could ultimately harm or even end humanity altogether. So I'm wondering what you think, as people wake up to some of these concerns, what you think they should be concerned about. I'm very worried that the AI field itself is doing it itself a disservice right now because people are squabbling over short-term versus long-term risks. To me, this is like saying, I work on traffic fatalities and you guys are studying cancer and heart disease. Like, why are you doing that? Traffic accidents happen now where these other people are like, far more people die of, of cancer and heart disease than traffic accidents. Why are you studying that? Well, obviously we need to study both. There are short-term risks and there are long-term risks here. Short-term risks include things like misinformation and disinformation that I emphasized. Long-term risk is we don't know how to control these systems. We don't know what bad actors are going to do. We don't know how to put safeguards on them. And that could get pretty bad. And no, that's not going to happen tomorrow because the systems are still pretty limited. But we are already seeing signs, for example, of people pretending at calamities in order to manipulate markets. Probably people will cause calamities using these things and manipulate markets. I don't know if the robots will ever try to take over the world. I still think of that particular scenario as fanciful, but there are lots of other things to worry about. And I will give you one positive note, which is right now robots are really dumb. You really don't have to worry about them. I joked in 2019, if the robots come for you, first close the door. 
that's still kind of true. And number two, if that doesn't work, lock the door. There is no, you know, robot that knows how to unlock a door right now. So, you know, I would not be worried about that particular scenario, but I would be worried about, for example, people repurposing drones as weapons and things like that. So there, there is plenty of stuff to be worried about short term, medium term, long term. And there's no one silver bullet here. This is why we don't, no single policy is going to solve this either. There's a lot going on. You know, th these technologies can be used in many ways. And there are a lot of bad actors that are going to try. You know, something else that's pretty confusing. What are the economics here? A lot of the excitement is people think there's like multi-trillion dollar markets. A bunch of consulting firms have said that. As we speak, there's a rumor that some of OpenAI's employees are going to sell stock at $90 billion valuation. So there's a lot of excitement here. But if you actually look at the economics so far, I'm not sure that it's justified. The strongest argument is that OpenAI is, quote, on a track to make a billion dollars this year. But if you look carefully, that's a billion dollars in revenue, but it's very expensive to run their systems. It's probably based on the first six months of the year when things were skyrocketing and it's already starting by some measures to decline. And the only things that are really clear business cases are the computer program assistance. Like, there's no question that programmers love this stuff. But is that a trillion dollar market? Or maybe it's like, you know, five, $10 billion a year. Then there's the fact that a lot of people know how to build this technology right now. So, you know, OpenAI knows how to do it, but Facebook is giving it away for free. So who's going to pay for it if Facebook or Meta gives it away for free? So there's questions about what the technical mode is, as we say, about, you know, how one company is going to control the market and whether they can. They're very expensive to operate. And there's no super clear business case yet. You know, if the stuff worked perfectly, then I think there would be an enormous market. But if it continues to be unreliable, then people may just play around with it for a while and say, yeah, but I can't really do this in these mission critical operations. So my bet is there will be billions of dollars made, but the valuations of the companies collectively will soon be trillions of dollars. And that math doesn't really add up. So we'll see. The show is produced by me and Anthony Green with help from Emma Silicons. It's mixed by Garrett Lang with original music from him and Jacob Gorski. Thanks for listening. I'm Jennifer Strong. <laughs>